Delta DX looking Europe. My name is Matt. Maria, Alexei, Tatiana, Tatiana. Matt is my name. QSL. <laughs> contact uh, with ham radio was when I was a kid and I was uh, driving my bicycle around the neighborhood. So I would ride down the street on a bicycle and see a ham's antenna. And there was a guy with a tower in his backyard and I thought, hmm, that's interesting. To go knock on somebody's door. I knocked on his door and said, hey, what's this? <laughs> and he said, come on back and I'll show you. Is that a ham radio antenna? I'm interested in it. And they would take in and show you what was going on. His name was Ed Passow. He was K4CI. He put the set of headphones on my head, and all of a sudden I heard a guy on a ship out in the ocean off of South Africa. And he keyed up the mic and talked to the guy, and the guy responded. That was my introduction. I thought, this is really interesting. My first contact was made with this and that and a very simple wire antenna. I was so thrilled when I made a contact all the way to the West Coast with that central station. That was almost a thrill like getting Mongolia years later, 160 meters. You're trying to get people on the other side of the earth, or the world. You're trying to perhaps uh, rack up a number of countries that you haven't talked to people before. This card right here is from Mongolia, and uh, that's represents one of the most unique contacts I ever made because Mongolia is directly on the other side of the globe. And the King of Spain is a ham radio operator and I have worked him. I got a call, a real strong signal. I went back and I said, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get your whole call. He said, that is my whole call. It was J1 Alpha and he was the king of, as we all know, <laughs> King Hussein. And I, I, that, that was a, a really exciting moment. When rare stations would come on the air, everybody tries to contact them. And then there's some people that actually uh, are not on the air because nobody has gone out there. And a lot of people go to rare and exotic places to experience the thrill of being the hunted rather than the hunter. That was what we call the expedition. We decided we wanted to go on one of these trips. And then it was announced that this little possession of the U.S. called Navassa Island was qualified as a separate entity or country. That paved the way a little bit and Don managed to get the Coast Guard permission and, uh, and the FCC license. But then we still needed a way to get there. So we looked in our call book and we could see that there was a radio club in Santiago, Cuba, which was the closest major port to Navasco. I wrote to the president of this radio club. I sent him a letter, told him what we wanted to do. And to my amazement, the guy wrote back and he said, I have found this boat for you. It's a yacht that belongs to the president of the Bacardi Rum Company. I'm his next door neighbor. Just an incredible piece of luck came up. Presto. Any other way, we'd never gotten there. So we actually then really did a coup. We were the first people to operate from this island. People managed to hear us, and we were three penniless teenagers that did it. Nothing like that's ever happened. Hello, Mike Four, Whiskey Air Alpha. I got my license in 2008. And I had a friend who told me about another guy who had seven towers at his house. And I was like, okay, that's six too many, right? <laughs> and so I went out to meet him and he introduced me to the contesting part of ham radio, which I never heard of. So if you get in what's called a DX contest, it's as a weekend, there's a whole lot of stations from all over the world participate in that. And so you can accumulate a lot of countries just by being on that one weekend. You're going to have a greater chance of finding somebody on the other side of the world in a contest. Because everybody's going to be on the air trying to talk to everybody else. Again, you're not competing against someone else. You're really competing within yourself to, to get to a certain level in the hobby. Once you get to that point, then your job is to share the hobby. 
what I try to do is to really get these guys interested in coming here to work contests, as an example. I also open the band up if a guy wants to work a certain country that's hard to work and he doesn't have the, let's say he doesn't have an antenna that's quite good enough to work with the guy in Hong Kong and he wants to work it, I open the station up for those guys so that they can all use my station to enhance their uh, situations. The, the camaraderie of the, um, of the ham radio community, which is, you know, come on in, you know, let's just try to show off this hobby to others and, and welcome other people in. In contesting, you're trying to get as many points as possible and you can't work a 48 hour shift by yourself usually. <laughs> So you'll have your friends come in and split it up and take shifts. And it was because of the graciousness of Jonathan and, 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 um, and Nancy that, you know, I've come back and he just says, come on back and we'll work this contest this year, or this part of the year. And, um, you know, that's part of ham radio is, is, is the people getting to know each other that way. Maybe a part of the incentive is waffles in the morning. <laughs> Maybe I'm guessing uh, mid-50s and it's cloudy, overcast. I enjoy talking to people in different parts of the world and making friends. I've got friends that live in Japan that I talk to on a pretty regular basis. You build just friendships. We don't see each other every day or every week, you know, but uh, we talk on the air occasionally and the club meetings are a bit of camaraderie. It's just a, it's just a kind of a social thing instead of a bridge match or a chess match it happens to focus on radio. The, the big thing is the people. You're, you're invited somewhere the first time, you know, to a group meeting based on your interest and then fine, but the reason you're, you're here the second and third time is because people are nice enough to have you back and share their investment in the hobby with others. Recently we had a visitor who was touring the world, a retired guy from Western Australia and he had been in contact with a close friend of mine in our club. So because of their friendship on the radio, John just said, well, you come over here and visit Richmond on your tour of the States, and I'll see that you see the right things and meet like-minded amateurs. And it turned out I had contact with this guy years ago, and he, <laughs> he came over here, must have a good record system, with a card that we had exchanged, one of my side cards that I had sent him and actually visited here. We just had a great time. Later on, he said on email that, uh, he said, well, he had gone been to a lot of cities and where the local amateurs hosted him, but we did the best in Richmond on our hospitality. So I was kind of proud of that. Jonathan talks in the evenings on a group. Uh, somebody in New Hampshire, somebody in New York, North Carolina, Tennessee, and they all chat around. And once in a while, I'll get on and say, hi, Bob, How, you know, tell Carol hi, and Carol will say, hi, Nancy, in the background. I think they have come up here twice we visited. Um, in fact, they were up here in August, and there were about five of them. Some of them met for the first time. Jonathan's been down to Tennessee. We find out about each other, and, and you really make friendships. <laughs> By and large, it's one of the most welcoming communities that I've ever experienced. 